uh, I want to thank you for volunteering. Um, I'm volunteering my time this morning, and I come this morning to serve you. That's why I'm here. Uh, I am the owner and operator of Insights Educational and Treatment Services. We have two clinics, one in uh, Lexington and one in St. Andrews, Columbia area. They're two behavioral health centers. We provide educational intervention and treatment for uh, 16 and older. We do a lot of the underage drinking, simple possession of marijuana programs. We're a licensed outpatient treatment center for chemical dependency, but we're also a behavioral health center. And I brought some material here. I have my card and some brochures about my agency. The, um, uh, we do uh, also kind of a lot of behavioral health. We've been doing some cognitive behavioral programs we call Good Life. We do personal development programs. For adults, we also, of course, do criminal domestic violence, uh, counseling. Uh, we do a variety of services, and I don't want to take too much time doing that, but I want you to know that Insights uh, is available as a resource. And I've brought material to describe it, and I've also brought some cards. If you've got questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I think, again, I have a pretty solid agenda. Oh, look, it's getting closer. Uh, I have a pretty solid agenda for today's presentation. If you want, I'll stay for Q&A after, and I think I get a few minutes between, I get a morning, two morning sessions, and I will stay for questions and answers, and then I'll be around. I think there's a lunch today, so I'll, I'll be of service to you throughout the day. So, um, hey, come on in. That guy's filming, that's why he's standing up in the back there. <laughs> we get it? Okay, yeah. did you guys see me in this? That's all you get, all right? That's it, that's it. It's a little warm in here. Is it warm in here? It is. Oh, it was just me. Um, all right. I'm going to roll. See this slide here? Right here, that, that slide? That's what we're on right now. This is called the intro part. I'm about to launch into the uh, outline of this session. But we, we, we do, oh, you are good. You're not going anywhere, are you? addictions, because I'm putting together 
cognitive behavioral psychotherapy and marrying it with addictive disorder treatment or step therapy is what it's called now. We just call it the steps of recovery. Uh, we found in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous in those programs, but now there's a whole brand of therapy called step therapy. Isn't that interesting? So, um, but I, I was step therapy before it was cool, let me tell you. And um, let's get into this. The first thing I want to do is we're going to look at intoxicating substance, and I, I'm throwing down. I don't know about you. What'd you bring to the party? I, I'm throwing down. I brought a whole cornucopia of goodies today, and we're going to be looking at intoxicating substance, not one specific drug, although we could go down and look at one drug, one drug, not, but I'm going to say that they're, what they all have in common is they're all intoxicating. I'm going to look at addiction as a pleasure disorder, and that's going to be my thrust today. It's not just uh, uh, I'm an alcoholic who's addicted to alcohol, or I, I could be a potaholic, can I get a witness, um, or a marijuana, I have marijuana-ism. We're going to be looking at that it's an addictive disorder, but the way to define it, it's a pleasure disorder. That's what addiction is. It's a pleasure disorder. It's the diseasing of the body's natural pleasure mechanism. What I'm going to show you is the biochemical, uh, it's the mesolimbic mesocortical dopamine system. And what an addictive disorder is, is the diseasing of that natural apparatus, that part of the brain that controls and regulates pleasure. And when somebody uses intoxicating substance, that's the apparatus of the brain that becomes sick and or diseased. I'm going to show you that, how that works. We're also going to look at why adolescents are at such high risk. We're going to see, look at some of the things that are going on in the brain of the adolescent and why they take to drugs like a duck takes to water. It's just like they're just ready to go. And we're going to show you that the, ap the apparatus of their brain and how it's formed and where it's at at stage development just makes them susceptible. That their brain naturally is looking for adventure in whatever comes along. And that's the way their brain's supposed to work. They're supposed to be that way. And when, and when they get uh, substances just thrown in the mix or uh, chronic patterns of masturbation or gambling, or we're not going to get into too much of that. But what will happen is the brain just goes and just loves it. And it just goes through this biochemical metamorphosis. I'll show you a little bit of that. We're also going to look at some of the warning signs. You know, how do you know if somebody's in, uh, abusing chemicals? And I'm going to show you some of those warning signs, but not in a specific way. Red eyes and smells and isolative behavior and avoiding social uh, family uh, events. I'm not going to get into those details. I'm going to sort of look at it as a broad stroke. And I want to say that I trust your intuition. If you think somebody's abusing in chemicals, they're abusing chemicals. And I think one of the messages I'm always giving parents with uh, kids who are uh, potentially abusing substance abuse is you know your kid. And if you think something's going on with them, there's something going on with them. You need to trust your intuition. And a lot of parents, they have their own, they're floating down a river called denial, amen. And they, they, they're actually trying to say it's not true, it's not true, it's not my Johnny, it's not my Johnny. My Johnny would never do such a thing. It's the couple, I mean, it's the kids he hangs out with. Here's what I'm teaching the parents. Your kid's hanging around with other kids that are waking and bacon because he's waking and bacon. He's getting high. If all his friends are going to jail, he's going too. He who walks in the company of fools is he too a fool. That's right. And they're just going to hang with people because that's who they're like. It's not peer pressure. You choose to be with people who are like you. Remember when you were in high school? Who did the jocks hang around with? The jocks. And who did the band people hang with? The band. And who did the freaks hang with? Me. And, um, <laughs> we were all together. Out the back, smoking cigarettes. You know what I'm talking about. And um, that's who we hung around with. We hung around with people who were like us. And we still do that. That's who, you, that's who you hang with, people who are like you. And we're going to look at the one, and then we're going to look at treatment. How do you treat somebody who has this disorder? And not just, I'm going to look at it from a three tiered approach from uh, prevention, intervention, and treatment. I'm going to look at those distinctions. So, what you're supposed to do when you present is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. That's how you present, right? Here we go. Um, oops, that was me. That one was me. We're going to get into first the different intoxicants. And uh, I've been talking a lot the last couple of days, so just bear with me. I talk for a living. My kids say uh, I do cycle babble. That's my job. And um, let's take a look at it. You can see this is depicting alcohol, uh, the uh, alcohol. 
Let me tell you a little bit about alcohol. Does anyone know alcohol on a very simple level, why people drink alcohol? There's only one reason why people drink. There's one reason. It's why you drink, I drink, anybody drinks. There's one reason. What does alcohol do for you that no other drug, I mean, no other beverage uh, will do? What it'll do is get you drunk. That's why people drink beer. It's not root beer. It's not thirst. It's because it gets them drunk. That's what people drink. And if you really want to know what alcohol is, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, provocative, you really need to know your biochemical on a very level, simple level. What is alcohol? Well, you get some sugar, and then you get some yeast. And you have the yeast eat the sugar, and then it poops out alcohol. If you really want to know what alcohol is, it's poop. That's what it is. Now, it might be good poop. That's some good poop, man. <laughs> what are you doing that? We're drinking poop. Yeah. There's another word I'd use, but there might be some Baptists in the house. And, um, but I'm drinking. <laughs> Amen, brother, brother. And um, what happens is that I'm drinking poop. That's good poop. But why would people drink this poop? Because it gets them drunk. That's why they drink this poop. It's really just a, it's an intoxicating substance. And it's in a group of lots of substances. And, and we have all these opinions that, you know, oh, what's a drug? Well, if we went out tonight and somebody said, hey, dude, you want to do shots? And we would never think of shots. Just to put it into your context, our society has sort of skipped over alcohol. But what is alcohol? On a biological level, Alcohol is very similar to what drug that we associate with needles? Heroin. Heroin or opioids. What? Ever seen those old movies and the guy takes an arrow? Shoo, and they're like, oh, Tex, we're going to have to cut this bad boy out. What do we have Tex do so that we can sedate him and take out the arrow? Drink him some red eye. That's right. We're going to sedate him. We're going to use alcohol for its medicinal purposes so that we can operate and sedate his brain. I know people who use beer to operate all the time. They would never get lucky if there wasn't beer. You know what I'm talking about? They're going to use alcohol tonight to operate. <laughs> alcohol is very similar to opioids. It's a central nervous depressant. It sedates the brain, but more importantly, it creates euphoria. You get drunk, and that's why people drink that poop. And to say that somehow different, because it comes in all these <coughs> fancy bottles, and you can now get it all kinds of special ways, and sparks, and tilt, and all kinds of different things. The truth of the matter is we're just taking drugs, and we're, we're just changing the label on them. By the way, if you want to know what this really is on a very simple level, what you're doing is mixing mild stimulants, amphetamine, uh, caffeine, and alcohol together. You know what this really is? It's a speedball. That's what it is. When you mix heroin and alcohol in it, what you get? Speedball. When you mix this together, what you get? Speedball. That's the most, one of the most popular drinks going right now, is mixing stimulants and alcohol together. Because the stimulants give you that first quick buzz, and then the alcohol catches up. And it's like somebody just, you fall through a hole. And that's why they love it. They love it. It's good stuff. And um, who would have ever thought that we have, you know, that, here's one I just want to move on. Who would have ever thought that this would be one of the most addictive drugs? Ever going. It says Sudafex. And we make methamphetamines out. Our kids are using stuff, triple C, Roboman, which is Robitussin. They're using cough meds. Things I don't even know. I'm like, what? Because you know there's some kid being a junior scientist researching what'll get you off. If you eat this and you eat 16 of them, what happens? Who is that kid? You know what I mean? He, he's uh, working for some major corporation now. Um, <laughs> You know, we have an idea, we villainize some drugs, and we legitimize other <coughs> drugs, and we say one is good and one is bad, and um, bull. A drug is a drug. They're all what we would call uh, psychoactive intoxicants. They're drugs, they're substances. Some are villainized in our society, and some are, oh, it's not a bad problem. It's, only marijuana, grab a hiney. It's only marijuana. And your kids are going to say, but it's only pot. It's natural. Hemp forever, dude. It's natural. <laughs> and the answer you want to be able to say is that legality has no effect on its intoxicating properties and its potential for abuse and addiction. Let me tell you, by far, what is the most addictive drug in America today? Tobacco, nicotine. 
number one. What is the most destructive? Alcohol. There's a big issue that's going on right now about marijuana. It should be legal. We'll use it for medicinal purpose. And again, whether or not it becomes legal or illegal has nothing to do with the fact that it's intoxicating. And if it's intoxicating, if it's a psychoactive chemical intoxicating, it's potentially addictive. Legality has no effect. And the laws that we've tried to create to legislate morality and change our society not always work. These laws around marijuana, the laws around alcohol, you can't legislate. If you want to know, why did they change the law that you would have to be 21 to drink? I don't know if you guys remember, there was a time that anybody could drink. Then there was a time that nobody could drink, called prohibition. They were smuggling drugs from Canada, just like they are today. Work with me on that. And um, then we had the issue that it became, oh, 18. And then it was 21. Well, here's why. The Hennefield study came along and said, if you don't have alcohol until you're 21 years old, your chances of becoming addicted to it drop to about 3 to 5%. But if you drink alcohol from 12 to 15 ages, your chances go up to 18% that you're going to become an alcoholic. So you know what we did? We tried to legislate health. Thou shalt not drink until you're 21, saith the government. You will not have alcohol. You know, we've now, it's been a law for 25 years. You know what we found? It has had very little impact on underage drinking. I mean, of drinking habits among high school and college age students. Very little impact. New study that came out of Wisconsin I thought was really interesting. What if it actually made underage drinking worse? That the rate of drinking has slightly dropped. But when kids go to drink, they drink more than ever. Because what are they doing? They're not going out to drink at a club or a bar or go out dancing. They're going to somebody's house because you're not home. And they're drinking. Not, not that they're drinking. They're drinking. Where are you going tonight? We're going drinking. Now, what are you going to do tonight? We're going to drink. That's the whole reason why we're here today, is we're here to drink. And what we have found is the rate of problem drinking among our youth has actually gone up over the last 25 years. Isn't that interesting? Because when the kids go to drinking, they go to drinking. And they drink more than ever. And the most dangerous, just to have this in your head, the most dangerous form of drinking pattern, binge drinking, followed by this, competitive drinking games. It sounds something like this. I can drink your ass on the table. That's right. I can drink more than you. I'll try to tone down the language. I do run an alcohol and drug rehab. Um, I can drink more than you can. And when we get into a competition, there's a problem. We're in danger. Uh, I was used to be a bartender. I know that comes as a complete surprise. I was a bartender in graduate school. <laughs> good job. Um, pretty good. The, um, the issue is this. We had in our, our little bar for a little while um, an intoximeter for $5. You put in a machine. You get a little pipe that, and you would blow into the machine. And it would tell you what your BAC was, blood alcohol concentration. After a few months, the bar owner took, the, took it out. Why? Why can't you have a device like that in a college bar? Why? Come on, people have fun. We're all, we're all going to die. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> well, there's a liability. I know you're drunk. That's a big issue, yeah. It's again, the same people in the house. Bingo! 2-2? <laughs> Man, I got a 3-6! <laughs> I get a Cupid doll and arrive home with the police. Um, <laughs> And that's what they were doing. They were competing as to who could drink the most. Very dangerous. So again, what do they all have in common? They all get you high. Some bring you up, some bring you down, some bring you every which way but loose, some bring you out in the left field. Those left-handed cigarettes, that's what my dad would call them. Left-handed cigarettes. I don't know what that ever meant. But um, <laughs> all these chemicals have one thing in common. They all get you high. It doesn't matter if they're legal if they're in vogue or out of vogue. They're what we call intoxicating, psychoactive, psych, psychoactive drugs. And we have a whole bunch of them. There's drugs out there we don't even know about yet. Like, who is the guy who discovered licking toads? Come on, what's up with that? Uh, who discovered that? How did you know that? How did you know that if you ate two whole packs of um, uh, Sudafed, if you just ate them real quick, that you would get high? It'd feel like you were tripping. 
Who discovered that? And, and, and you know, what are they doing now? <laughs> These are all the, look at them all. And here's some behaviors. I just wanted to mention, we're now looking at, there's a lot of behaviors that stimulate pleasure, euphoria. There's psycho, psycho activating intoxicants. And this is in your slide, in, in your packet. Um, and we're going to notice that some of the natural pleasures, because what I'm going to show you is, again, that addiction is a diseasing of the body's natural pleasure mechanism. What an addictive disorder is, is using an artificial substance or a very powerful behavior in such a way that you actually change the neurochemistry of your brain. Your brain was built for pleasure. Uh, I don't think I would tell this one to my pastor, but here's the joke. Why did God put so many nerve endings in, in your genitals? He likes to hear his name called. The idea is that our bodies were built for pleasure. It is a natural system, and it's called the sexual response system. It is such a power. You remember pleasure. Let me tell you, my friends, you remember your first sexual experience. You might not remember your second and there's a few of you trying to remember the third. <laughs> but, uh, um, but the truth of the matter is, our brains were built for pleasure. We have a system in our brain that actually creates and maintains and controls pleasure. It's called the mesolimbic mesocortical dopamine system. And that apparatus was put and placed in our brain to control and regulate pleasure. And what has happened is we are now taking artificial substances and behaviors that we can repeat. And we're, what we're doing is we're taking the natural pleasure mechanism of the brain of, uh, let's look at sexual response, and that's what I'm equating it to, anxiety. You know, I want, I desire, lust, and horniness, I want. And that's the same thing you're going to see in, in my, my drug addicts. Want, lust, we call it craving. Urgh, I want. Followed by anticipatory, oh, man, get me some. This is going to be good. He's got the lights turned down. He's got the music on. Uh, he's got this all, or she's got the bed turned down. She's got that outfit on. <laughs> Man, that's called anticipatory. It's eroticism. It's it almost, you know, a lot of my clients will talk about it. They can bring it up like a lover. They'll conjure it up in their minds. And their, their, their imaginations will literally bring it to the point where they're excited. And if you use your imagination, you can literally change your physiology. Remember? And um, it's called eroticism. <laughs> you can literally conjure up images in your mind that literally start to change your heart. I hope so. <laughs> the plumbing's working. Things are literally going to change. And there is anticipatory or excitatory. Then there's a hit or the high. And, and of course, a sexual response is called an orgasm. An orgasm is a, a building up of these chemicals in a rapid release. That's getting high. It's this excitatory behavior that leads in a kind of climactic or pleasurable experience. Getting off, getting high. And then the person comes back down. But unfortunately, with my addicts, we ain't get no satisfaction. And what do they want to do? They want to do it again, and again, and again, and, and again. Oh, and again, and then again. I'm looking at the chart to see if I can show you how I do it. And again, and again, and again, and again. Just to think about it. If you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, for a year. That's 28,000 hits. Just, I want you to think about that. 28,000 hits. And what's happening is that you're literally changing the neurochemical structure of the brain. What addiction really is on a very simple level is by using these very powerful intoxicating substances and behaviors in an addictive fashion by using them repetitively, over and over and over again, you're literally changing your brain. It's changing the neurochemistry. That client is going through a biochemical metamorphosis. They're changing. And look, just to see the man back here, Elvis? Hey, Elvis, what's up? And um, <laughs> look at Elvis's face. See Elvis? Chemicals did that to Elvis. Look at him. Chemicals did that to him. See that hair growing out from underneath his lip? See that stuff growing out of his face? Chemicals did that to him. When he was a little boy, he didn't have that hair growing out of his face. And ladies, don't let it happen to you. And what happened to Elvis is he started going through a biochemical metamorphosis because of his exposure to a very powerful luteinizing hormone. 
And it has permanently altered the structure of Elvis. He is a new creation, a new creature on a biological, biochemical level. What change did Elvis go through? Testosterone. That's right. He was exposed to a luteinizing hormone called testosterone, and he has gone through a permanent alteration. He's become a man. If you shave that thing off tonight, Elvis, what's going to happen tomorrow? Start it's coming right back, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. And the more you shave it, the more it comes back. You notice that? And uh, Because you're different now. You've gone through from being a boy, and you've gone through a biochemical metamorphosis, and you've become a man. Chemicals have changed you. That's what happens when people use intoxicants. It literally changes them on a physiological level. Elvis is a different pre His throat, his muscle structures, the body patterns of hair are all different. So again, this is the normal pleasure system found in our bodies. What is happening, and I couldn't draw this to scale, is we're using intoxicating substances that are mimicking the same biochemical structure and literally altering the chemistry of the brain. Addiction is a pleasure disorder. Pleasure is built in three mechanisms of the brain. There is uh, pleasure disorders are found in these three things. We're going to talk about neuroadaption real quick. Tolerance from withdrawal, which is your body protecting itself. And then I, uh, in Elvis's example, I was uh, looking at the neurobiological uh, metamorphosis. Uh, just help me. You can see I'm a talker. The reason I have these slides is not for you, it's for me. I, I'm a little bit um, manic. The, but I'll come back to task. What time am I supposed to? Does anyone know how long I'm here? Oh, oh man, I got plenty of time. Yeah, I'm from New York. I talk fast. Right? <laughs> Just you get it. Got to think fast. Here we go. Um, addiction is a diseasing of the body's natural pleasure mechanism. By using these very powerful psychoactive intoxicants, and it doesn't matter which ones, or intoxicating behaviors, it literally changes the neurochemistry of the brain. I want you to just know, and I, I, I pared my training down to try to get to these points, that the pleasure system has got to do with desire, which is, I want. It's called craving. We might look at it as people, places, and things cues that set off desire, just like eroticism would be stimulated. Um, yeah. Quick question. Uh, the addiction changes the brain. Yes. And I, I, I certainly don't have, I don't think I have any titles in my name, so I'm just poor dumb youth pastor. Uh, but when a person gives up that addiction, I understand for someone there's a process to come back. Is there the ability for the brain to realign some of those pathways. Good question, Pastor. And uh, here's the answer. Three times I asked for that thorn in my flesh to be removed. That's right. And once I've been changed, I can never go back. Uh, I've been clean and sober 23 years. I'm still a drug addict. I'm still an alcoholic. I just don't use. Now, can we heal the addictive brain? Can we create new neurochemical structures that overlay and sort of moot or bring less significance or bypass. But, well, but it's always there. And this is how I teach it to a client. It's like an allergy. Addictions is an allergy. And you're just as allergic today as tomorrow is in 10 years. And because I'm a recovering person, I'm an addict, alcoholic. Even though I haven't used in 23 years, that addictive disorder is lying dormant within me. And if I use psychoactive intoxicants, if I use these chemicals, what happens is I just wake that monster back up again. And even though I am a new creation, I still have Adam. I still have my flesh. And even though someone might be growing along spiritual lines, they still have this physiological structure. It's chronic. It never goes away. <clears throat> Elvis is a man today and tomorrow. He might act like a little boy. We'll talk to his wife later. But he is a man. <laughs> and he will never go back because he has gone through a change. And that change is permanent. Can we learn new things? I, it's well beyond this training, but I actually teach people how to have a healthy relationship with pleasure. How to learn what are the natural pleasures in life and how do you get them? And one of them, I'm hoping they're finding it at your church. That when they're going into church, they're having that experience of I love God. 
And it's such a powerful experience that it literally is spirit-filled. And the Holy Spirit comes to them and they feel the pleasure of that love. What a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, yeah, I, I, how about we do this? Give me a couple minutes and then I'll, I'll come back. You got, you got a question? Just give me a minute. Yes, ma'am. Out of love and respect. Very addictive. We might say, can somebody become addicted to prescription? Yeah, you know what I see? Predominantly benzodiazepines, Valium, Xanax, Adderall, and I mean uh, Ativan, and uh, we also Ativan, I mean Adderall was in my head to say. Benzodiazepines and opioids are my predominant prescription. Pain meds, stress meds, um, anything that you can use to get off on. And uh, Adderall, a lot of our kids are using Adderall, and surely prescription drugs are highly addictive. My assertion, ma'am, is that if it can get you off, it can get you addicted. If it can produce a, a rapid sense of euphoria or pleasure, it's potentially addictive. Good question. And um, the three interrelated, 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 interrelated systems are desire, experience, and modulation. Um, what happens is this. When you use a very powerful chemical, pharmaceutical, <coughs> prescription, alcohol, <coughs> marijuana, cocaine, whatever it is, it produces such a boom such a powerful experience of pleasure that your body says, whoa, I need to protect myself. And that's really what's happening, is when somebody uses these powerful intoxicating substances or behaviors, the body says, that's too much. We need to protect ourselves, and it's called neurochemical mod modification. It's your body trying to protect you from too much pleasure. There's a built-in governor that says we got to modulate pleasure. And so in your body's attempt to protect itself from too much pleasure, it's actually lying, it's, it's, it's creating itself to be increasingly vulnerable to addiction. It's making it more susceptible to addiction. So let's, let's look into that. The three kind of neuroadaption, tolerance, craving, and withdrawal. The person does it more and enjoys it less. They're more and more preoccupied. It fills up more of their imagination and, and mind, but when they finally get it, it doesn't work. And that's the cornerstone of addiction. I want it more and enjoy it less. I want, I want, I want, but even when I get it, it doesn't do anything for me. Is it safe to say that that would be because the very first high would be the most explosive and we can't reach that high anymore? Yes, that's one of the phenomena. That's called uh, we call it chasing that memory of that first high. And I tried to make um, I didn't want to be too uh, the idea that you remember your first experience, your sexual experience, because it's such a powerful memory. And then what we're finding is an interesting, interesting. The church has come up with that. The more partners you have sexually, the less significant they are to you. Isn't that interesting? That there's a a scar in promiscuity that you care less. The more sexually promiscuous you are, the less sexuality matters to you. But yet you'll pursue it. My sex addicts are not sexual creatures. Isn't that sound weird? They're pursuing sex, but it's like say no to crack. They're, they're pursuing sex like a drug. Pursuing not out of love for the right to get off, to get a hit. And it's no longer embracing loving relationship with wife. It's looking. With, with a hungry eye, looking for the next hit. It, it's Miss Right Now. <laughs> it's not Miss Right, it's Miss Right Now. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then they pursue it to their death. The wages of sin are death. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, well, the cause of addiction is using these psychoactive chemicals. And in your body's attempt to protect itself from pleasure, it is actually producing a biochemical rut in the mesolimbic dopamine system built with a chemical structure of THIQ, again, I, I, I'm pulling this down, it's an enzymatic effect. Your body, there's all this pleasure, so the body's trying to protect itself from pleasure. It's trying to desensitize your brain from pleasure. It's trying to insulate you from pleasure, protect you from pleasure. And the more it protects you from pleasure, the more you pursue the pleasure. And as you go on, what be happens is, what do we find in our addicts? That's the only source of pleasure. 
they've become to a point as their addiction progresses, and this is being, we're moving forward, real quick, that they're to the point where, you know, you got a promotion at the job, whatever. You're gonna go to high school, maybe graduate, <coughs> whatever. Who cares? Oh, I said that recently in training. Is this true? The battle cry of adolescence. Whatever. 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 Who cares? But you're pregnant, honey, and you're 14. Whatever. You're getting kicked out of school. You're dropping out. You're going to jail. Whatever. Whatever. Who cares? Isn't that the battle cry? It's the insulative ability. It's the immaturity. We'll talk about that. I got to roll. And um, that's addictive disorders. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And um, what we know, everybody got this. Addiction is a biochemical uh, disease process. It is the diseasing of the body's natural pleasure system, the mesolimbic, mesocortical dopamine system. By using these very powerful intoxicants, we have actually changed the chemistry of the brain. We got that. Doesn't matter what, if they're legal or illegal, doesn't matter if they're liquid or powder or smokable. Um, addiction is a pleasure disorder. Okay. There we go. Why are adolescents, our kids, at such high risk? Here's the answer. Because not only do drugs give us pleasure, they also take away pain. And we know that they take away pain and they create a... Listen, I'm an adolescent. I'm going to a party. And I'm fat, ugly, and stupid. And people are looking at me. I ain't much, bro. I'm all I ever think about. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm narcissistic and preoccupied and uncomfortable. And if I was a little bit taller, I could have been a baller. And I, I feel terrible. And I go to a party and I drink four or five beers. And what happens? I can dance, I can do anything, I'm free. And what happened is, not only has intoxicants given me pleasure, what has it done for me? Taken away pain. Inhibitions, inhibitions, which are pure. It's a kind of thing, oh, I can't, people are looking at me. Eight beers later, I'm dancing on the table. And you know, that's another story I'll tell you later. Um, but it takes away my fears and my inhibitions. Our, my pastor knows this. There's another way to get rid of your fears and inhibitions. Serve others. Because when you're serving others, you're fearless. Aren't you? So, why is an adolescent so, so vulnerable to addiction? Because they take to it like a duck takes to water. Because they're hardwired for it, almost ready for it. Here's what happens. In, the, in, the addiction, in an adolescent brain, let's quickly give a quick look at this. The adolescent brain is hungry. Remember that movie, uh, The Little Shop of Horrors? Feed me! Feed me! The brain at an adolescent is in such a learning curve that it wants to be fed. It's a hungry brain. Like the hungry caterpillar. Ever read that one to your kids? The hungry caterpillar. And uh, it's this hungry brain. That's the way God made it. He made it so that that brain is literally seeking cortical stimulation. It wants to learn. It wants to learn. It wants to desire, devour information. That also, that natural setup makes them vulnerable for addictive disorders because the brain is hungry. It's looking for cortical stimulation. And when it finds, or it finds a beer, or it finds Skittles or drugs or whatever, what happens is, boom! It's a powerful experience because the brain is looking for that experience. Naturally, it's supposed to. You know, I do assessments for DSS. If I get a four-year-old kid who comes in my office and sits with his hands folded, sitting at a chair, not moving, not inquiring, not wanting to move around and look into every little thing, that kid's being abused. Your three and four-year-old kid should be into everything. I want to look into everything. I'd open Pandora's box. If I could get the key, I'd open it up. And so, and, and that. That stays with us. It's unfortunate when we get older that we're less curious. And we don't have that kind of desire to learn. Great study about Alzheimer's. You want to keep your marbles? You got to use your marbles. Because if you put them in a drawer and you don't you lose them, you, you, I mean, if you don't use them, you lose them. You want to keep from getting Alzheimer's? Keep learning. Keep volunteering. Keep serving the world in which you live. And you will have a life abundant. Hungry brain, immature brain. Here's what we know about the immature, the brain of it. The adolescent brain has a fully developed limbic system. 
but a very immature frontal lobe. The frontal lobe keeps growing. The frontal lobe is the governor. Let me introduce you to the frontal lobe. Ready? Shh. Listen, here it is. Right there, catch it. That's your frontal lobe. Catch it, right there. Hear it? You hear that little voice in your head right now? That one right there, Kimberly, saying, what in God's name is this guy talking about? <laughs> That's from your frontal lobe. The pastor might say it also has a divine origin, but neurochemically, that's a frontal lobe. It's inhibition. It's a governor. Don't do that, Kimberly. You should come to that, leave the party in the same clothes you came in. We have expectations of you, Kimberly. You're a professional woman, and you should not act that way. You're a mother, a, a, a wife, a family member. You shouldn't do those things. See, in the adolescent, that's not developed yet. <laughs> Can I get a witness? And, but the emotions are fully developed. As they're developing in their brain, their emotions are all out there. But the brain that inhibits them, that will be matured through a maturation process of developmental experiences, will begin to modify that. Yes, Pastor? I'm sorry. I'm asking. <laughs> Just do it. Uh, one of the things, I actually don't work at church. I work in a mission agency. I work with high-risk kids. Okay. Um, so do I. Yes. Uh, well, my goal is to try to keep them from coming to visit you. Okay. Uh, nothing personal. <laughs> my goal is to start young and stay strong. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, one of the things that I've been reading, uh, trying to understand better, is particularly the boys or girls too, but the kids that are diagnosed with the ADHD, also sometimes the bipolar, that this, this, this governing portion of the brain, the frontal lobe, not only is it... Um, not only is it immature, but it actually matures up to 30 or 40 percent. It takes 30 yes. or 40 percent longer, so they have a greater band of <clears throat> danger. Yes. Right now, it, it, the average person's brain doesn't fully complete maturation until about 23, 25. And what we're finding, and then there's some studies actually, the growth, a uh, 6 to 10 percent growth of the brain in our 20s, early 20s, which is really freaky, because your brain was the size of your brain when you were a little kid. That's why you remember you have to, the birth canal and there's a limited, your brain is pretty much the size, it doesn't grow that much, whereas the rest of you grows pretty big. It's an interesting phenomenon. Beyond the class, I'll get back to you. Sorry. Um, the emotional brain. We also know the risk factors that are, the adolescent is at high risk for addictive disorders because of the way their brain is. It's hungry, it's immature, it's not fully developed, and it's also very emotional. And here's what happens. I get all this feelings and I'm upset and angry and it's cool, dude. Whatever. There is no problem here. Dad used to be a butthead, now he's just some guy who lives in the other room. I'm not even angry at him anymore. Doesn't even care. It doesn't even matter. Another phenomenon is genetics. Why are our kids at such high risk? Genetics. It runs in families. So does ADHD. <laughs> um, can you imagine my pop? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we know that uh, genetics, we know families, if you have a direct family member, genetic predisposition, just like any other disease, diabetes, cancers, we can look down the genetic line. Guys, if you want to know what your hairline is going to look like, look at your mother's father. Sorry. Um, it's genetics. And we also know that there's risk factors. Does it run in a family? And another one is chemical exposure. If you drink one or two beers a week or a month, I doubt you're going to contract alcoholism. But you start getting tore up from the floor of Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Yeah. We call that college, and Daddy's paying ten thousand dollars a semester for that. Um, what begins to happen is you become very high risk for addiction. Also, how old you are when you got exposed to chemicals, the types of chemicals you're exposed to. Um, some drugs are more addictive than other drugs. It has to do with how powerfully they, they hit the mesolimbic system. You know, and uh, some drugs, like stimulants, are shazam. Other drugs are a little bit slower. So what's more addictive, cocaine or marijuana? Cocaine. cocaine. And by the way, what's nicotine? A smokable amphetamine. Just work with me, guys. 
And when we have our break, there's going to be people out there getting some. And um, <laughs> genetics, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> genetics is a factor, and then also the type, the rate, the age, and multiple factors. Yes, sir. Can genetics be altered without scientific? Uh, no. You are what you are. Your genetics is your fleshly man. I don't believe that there's going to be any change. So if I'm an addict, my son would have a higher risk for being an addict because he's my son. So if the neurological neuron or state, you know, uh, set to go one particular way and then do a new creation, can those neurons or neurological uh, no. ways be altered? I personally do not believe so. I don't believe even having a spiritual conversion changes the physiology of my brain. That's a hardwire phenomenon. Because when you get that, you're like, you get a concussion. Oh, or get that a damage, can, can you change the brain through a different way? Yes. yes. Oh, can. But I mean, I don't the know. brain itself. It's a mystery. Heal thyself. I, I don't, my opinion is no. That the fleshly body is as it is. It is under the rules of a fleshly dominion. Spiritual change is spiritually. Flesh is flesh. Can it be overcome? I do. Now, it, now it overcome meaning that I know how to live with it. Right. Yeah. Greater is he that is in me than yeah. me who is in the world. Yeah. It is not an issue that it just goes away. And I don't blame people come in. And they've had these profound religious experiences, and they're still addicts. They might not be using. They might be spirit-filled. They might be changing the world around them. They're still addicts. That's my opinion. Everybody's got one. You got one too. Some would, uh, some would disagree. Uh, uh, some would disagree. That's correct. I, I, that's my opinion. Right. That's my opinion. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> right. It's your own opinion. <laughs> We know that the brain is highly at risk because of certain uh, physiological things. I we're going to move on. And um, oh, there's a time. Should have looked there. Um, we know that. Uh, I'm working on. I'm almost there. I talked about Is that what yeah, God knows what time it is, right? Oh, hey, actually, it's, we're leaping forward this, this uh, winter. I mean, this, this weekend. Progression. Well, one of the things we find is that progression happens very quickly in adolescence. Whereas an adult starts using intoxicating chemicals, it might take. 10, 15, 20 years for them to develop an alcoholism. It might take our adolescent a few months. That illness is incredible. Because their brain is so susceptible, they take to it and respond very powerfully. The progression, the way I would describe it, is experimentation. Do kids looking for cortical stimulation try intoxicating substances and behaviors? Absolutely. That's called experimentation. But if you've been getting high every day for the last three years, you're no longer an experiment. You're a pothead. <laughs> you see the difference? It's not just trying, it's doing. Yes, ma'am. One of the studies that I read recently was looking at tolerance levels and how it, in, in, how it worked with addiction. <coughs> and at, with the, the kids, and they were looking at, I think, 18 to 25. How quickly tolerance years. is the amount you can, to mm -hmm. how much you can use. And the more you use it, the more you're running that chemical structure, and the quicker your brain converts into an addictive disorder. It's like turning a cucumber into a pickle. Once it's pickled, it's a pickle. Even if it gets dipped in holy water, I still believe it's a pickle. That's my opinion. Um, stay with me. Um, it goes from experimentation to misuse. Misuse of drugs is that when I use the drugs, it causes problems. But then as soon as I get in trouble or I get caught, I stop. I'm not going to use it while I'm in soccer or track. My parents found out I'm going to stop it. I don't want to get involved in that. There's a difference between experimenting, which is once or twice. Now, my friends, I experimented with pot. I smoked pot once for about 10 years. <laughs> and I realized when you smoke a fatty, you get high. Really? Extensive clinical study. Recapitulated that design multiple times. So experimentation, misuse is the repetitive experience of running out of time. Where are you? Then there's abuse. What's the difference between misuse and abuse? Is when they caught when you it causes problems, you stop in misuse. In abuse, you continue to use despite knowledge of adverse consequences. Dependency is both physical and emotional and mental. It is literally a dependent. I, I can't live without it. This can happen in, a, in an adult. It might take years. In an adolescent, months. How do you know?
know if somebody has an addictive disorder. Money's missing. They're not where they're supposed to be. Aberrant behavior. Their eyes are red. They smell funny. They stop hanging around with friends that are good. Now they're hanging around with friends that are bad. And all mama always says, it's peer pressure. He's hanging around with bad kids. And I'm going to say, because he's a bad kid. Oh, I hate saying that. It's because he's a, he wants to be with kids that are like him. If they're all boosting from stores and he gets caught boosting from stores, he's hanging with kids that are boosting from stores because that's what they do after school. They boost from stores. They're not playing soccer and they're not at the swim meet. They're boosting from stores. Trust your instincts. How do you know if there's a problem? You know, you know in your intuition. The biggest problem I work with, the professionals and, adult, and parents, is their own denial. <laughs> not my boy. <laughs> not my boy. He would never do that. <clears throat> You're wrong. Trust your instincts. Take an honest appraisal. Talk to somebody. Find wisdom. I also encourage people to know what's normal. I think studying what is normal. You know, adolescence doesn't have to be stormy. It doesn't have to always be such a problem. There is a normal maturation process biochemically, developmentally, it is present. And we can understand that and look for average. I have a friend of mine who's working in a, a checking for counterfeit bills. You know how you, you check for counterfeit bills? You, learn the real one. you know what a real bill looks like because then you can spot a fake bill a mile away. If you know what's normal in adolescent behavior and you know right from wrong because you have the power of discernment placed, then you know when they're wrong. You know when they're lying. And you know the <coughs> problem on my face? Denial. There's people floating down the river of denial saying, ain't my boy. Boy, it ain't your boy. Knowledge of uh, dramatic changes. Always look for changes. Changes in friends. Changes in scholastic behavior. Changes in what he does. How he sleeps. How he acts. How she does. What she does. Change. Disruption in what is normal. What's, what's normal? And then drug screening. I'm working with a family right now, and they're giving some privileges back to their son who has a drug problem. And here's what they're going to do. We believe that operating our minivan is a safety-sensitive function. So before you operate our vehicle, you will submit to urine drug testing. <coughs> That's what they do for truck drivers. That's right. If you're going to use my vehicle, you're going to submit to a drug screen. And then you know what? We're going to pop you when you get home, too. <laughs> Get the proofs in the pudding. So isn't that interesting? Because you, you know, we have this technology. We can look. I don't care what comes out of your mouth. I want to know what comes out the other end. Mm -hmm. What comes out of a man's lips that files him, right? And um, we know disruption in drug screening. Uh, I think being able to test for drugs is an important act. Uh, 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 brain is decreased to sensitive. I don't care. Whatever. You can't affect me. I don't care what you think or say. Increased sense. I'm very sensitive and moody and angry. It has its own anhedonia. These are in your slides. Cravings. And then we're I have a couple minutes. I go. How do we treat? I'm doing all right, right? Prevention. In prevention models, here's what I believe. This is my opinion. Prevention would be training and teaching people in wellness. How do you prevent wrong? By doing right. By staying fit and energy is the best way to keep from getting sick. Take your vitamin C. Stay healthy. That's how you prevent getting sick. We gotta teach it. Scaring kids away from drugs doesn't work. You drink, you drug, you're gonna die! And they're like, Whatever. <laughs> no, I'm not. Whatever. I'll be right with you, ladies. And um, prevention. Tr intervention. If um, I'm right there. Um, intervention. How do we intervene? You make using uncomfortable. That's intervention. Intervention is making it uncomfortable to use. Staying on them. Watching them. Monitoring. We want to interrupt. I want to be a fly in the ointment. Sand in the, in the sob. I want to make it difficult. In the treatment program, there's, we have a whole different way to treat adolescents than adults. And here's two things that I wanted to hit. The bottom. We can't wait for an adolescent to get to the bottom. My God, I can't wait for that. There's a saying that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you know what? We can make him thirsty. We can ride him like a dog and make him make it uncomfortable to use. See what I'm saying? Make it hard for him to use. And the last one is, we do need to look to our higher power to make changes. I didn't cause it, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. 
Addiction is a physiological disease that does respond to spiritual intervention. Amen. All right. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.